Whoa! Okay, what he just said about the war in heaven, Lucifer is able to convince one third of the angels to rebel against the perfect order that's in heaven. I think what I wanna see is, what are some of the places where they do this, where sort of Greek mythology and Christian theology might like intersect, and what are some points where it's just like, nah, that's not it at all. So this figure we're looking at here kind of looks like Greek mythology perspective. This might be like Virgil, who was this, uh, I think Roman poet who sort of serves as a guide through the underworld. In Christian theology though, there isn't a one-to-one -one parallel. Like that's a very sort of Greek mythological trope that you can go into the underworld and then potentially come back out of it. I really think that's important what he just said for those who do not fear the Lord. That line is so important because that fear has a dual nature. Baptism they did not have. The one gate. That's interesting because is that these babies weren't baptized. And I just think it's worth noting that baptism is a very interesting part of Christian faith that a lot of different sections of Christianity have way different viewpoints on. One other thing this just saw right before we got here, something interesting about like judge of the dead is in Greek mythology, there's like, I don't remember their names, but they're like three judges of the dead who work under the leader of the underworld himself. You just gave up the keys to the king. This is so interesting. The phrase she just used, uh, keys of the kingdom are interesting because that is something that is language found in scripture and the other disciples, they throw some different things at Jesus. And Peter comes up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, yeah, Peter, like you get it. Notice how like greed is large. Like greed looks just sort of oversaturated. It's a walking picture of being overindulged. We can't use greed as our excuse. Anger is a healthy human emotion. Again, even Jesus experienced anger and Jesus was the embodiment of like love in human form. Fire has a lot of symbolism in the Bible. In some places, fire is a good thing. In some places, fire uh, is a sign of refining. It's a sign of something getting stronger. Like it's a sign of purification. Gold is purified by fire. But then in other places of the Bible, fire symbolizes destruction, symbolizes torment. It symbolizes something bad. I think it's interesting that Lucifer is doing a couple of things in this moment. First, this whole little smoky sensation Lucifer's got going on is interesting because one of the beliefs is that the Bible refers to Lucifer as the prince of the powers of the air. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, so there's the Genesis reference. This is like a nod to Eve eating the fruit. And when she eats the fruit, important, not an apple, the Bible says fruit, that it introduces sin to the world. And though you may not understand it. He said, well done. So what you might hear in Christian spaces, people might say, hey, I'm just, I'm just trying to hear well done. Like that's the goal is that at the end of this journey, what gets pronounced is not that you were perfect, that you did everything right, but that well done in your fight to be the best you could, to live in line and in step with your faith. Trust me, you will see her again. You will see her again, huh? That's a Christian belief too, is that for those who are believers, we um, would see them again in heaven. It's a, a belief of hope that we would be in community again in the afterlife with people we love. This imagery we're seeing with the cross, every time he hits him, there's three crosses is interesting. There is a scene where uh, there are three crosses at Calvary. Jesus is hung on the middle cross. The Bible records that there are two thieves punished at the same time as Jesus. So I just think that's an interesting. This is something that is only really present in Greek mythology, this idea of soul exchange. Like, I'm gonna do this deal, you take my soul instead of this person's. Whoa! Okay, what he just said about the war in heaven, Lucifer is able to convince one third of the angels to rebel against the perfect order that's in heaven because Lucifer's main thing was he became envious of God. Yeah, so there we go, fallen sons of paradise, fallen angels. The Bible says that ultimately this one third are kicked out of heaven. This is something that's common in Christian scripture regarding Satan is that Satan always attempts to make promises that he cannot cash in on, will not cash in on, so he'll promise, hey, if you do this, I'll give you this. You do this, I'll take you here. 
And we see that commonly in scripture. Um, even when Satan had a conversation with Jesus, it was the same thing. I will give you the kingdom. Jesus is like, you can't give me the kingdom. <laughs> like I'm the son of God, I own all of this. So I think it's interesting that the final ploy was trying to promise Dante in this case, something that he knew Dante wanted. That's very Satan-like.